So I want to point out something that you're about to hear. Uh, what you're about to hear is someone going a little airy as they go into the higher notes. And this is not an uncommon problem. So let's just take a listen right here. <laughs> So what we heard there was actually a very, very common struggle. Uh, I'll demonstrate it myself. If I do, let me get my piano on. It's already on. I'm so on top of things. What you're hearing there is that breathiness up on the top. Um, there are a couple ways to mitigate that. Um, in in the in my specific example of what I did just now, I would need to add a little bit of laryngeal tilt, and I've covered this a couple times. It's hmm 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 try that again with that example with that in mind. And what that does, that tilt, is it will thin the folds and make them like a little tighter together. And that really does help uh, keep vocal closure. It adds a little bit of volume to the sound as well, which you may or may not want. Um, but that's one way to do it. Another way you can play with being airy versus not airy is by focusing on laryngeal height. Uh, so an exercise that you can do, which is funny, fun, and probably never something you should do uh, live or when recording, but it's a great exercise, would be the sob. The thob. And the thob looks a little something like this. Something I want you to take stock of is that I was keeping my tongue forward the whole time. You don't need to pull your tongue back to make that sound. And that's a mistake I think a lot of people make is they want to lower the larynx and so they use, you know, what makes sense. The tongue is an extremely large, powerful muscle and you can lower your larynx with the tongue. You're just also going to kill your sound. So the idea behind the sob is that you want to be able to do it without bringing your tongue back. And that's going to help you achieve that lower larynx, which is going to help you achieve a sound that is more reminiscent of a sound that you'd have lower in your voice. Makes sense, right? Here, I'll demonstrate. First, I'll show you the higher larynx. Very breathy, not very reminiscent of the lower part of the range. And now I'll show you the lowered larynx. Now, this is the exaggerated sound, the Oh, now again, I'm, I'm, I'm purposely making that sound uh, a little over the top for practice purposes. So let's take that idea of lowering the larynx and show you how it can be applied uh, when you're not being ridiculous. So we're going to... Right, so I can mix and match these things, blend them, and sort of get different degrees of these things. But to kind of find it at first, I, I went ridiculous mode. And I went, oh, because it's fun. And who doesn't like to have a little fun? All right, cheers. Let's uh, let's get on to the next video here and see if we can't answer more questions. So right here, um, shout out to Logan for starting this. And this is something that everyone's been following up doing. People send me a little note first and saying what they thought happened. So I tried to focus on not using Kurt's intonation necessarily and to relax some. It's also higher pitched, I think. At the end, there's a slight cameo by my cat that loves to check up real close on my dental work. All right, so let's watch this. Tell me where did you sleep last night? In the pines, in the pines, where the sun don't ever shine. I will shiver the whole night through. Oh. My girl, my girl, where will you go? So, um, that's a song that I really like uh, for her voice, um, and I've I've told her as much. So let's let's break that down. 
Uh, so the reason why I like that tune for her is that this is someone who has a, a pretty healthy um, lower range um, and does well in the range. And it has a lovely color and sound down there. So you want to play to your strengths as a singer. Um, you know, and I know that I've definitely uh, been guilty of taking on repertoire that is far too challenging and outside of my comfort zone. But, and this is a big but, when you're working on something, you want to make sure that the thing you're working on challenges you in small ways. You want to have your practice sessions being about increasing your success rate uh, and not about trying to work on things you cannot do at all. And so with this tune for her, this is a great tune. There's a lot she can already do, and there are some things in this tune that don't have a 100% or 90% success rate, namely those jumps to the top. As we saw in the last demonstration, right, this is something that she loses some color and some tone and gets a little airy on the top. And if we listen to it again, we'll see that that's not the case here. In the pines, in the pines, while the sun don't ever shine, I would shiver the whole night through. Hello, kitty. Kitty, 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 kitty. So you could kind of hear that in the, in the pines, in the pines, right? And when she goes up, it sounded like in the pines, in the pines. It, just a hint of airiness. So it wasn't all the way airy like it was in the last demonstration, but it's a different tune, right? And so you can take these tunes that sound good for you, right? Like, was that airiness really that bad? No, not at all. It sounded great. And so you could take things that, that, that sound pretty good in your voice right now and then continue performing, continue sharing your voice, and then still keep working on things. And not only does it allow you to put yourself out there while you're working on stuff, but it's actually a better way to work on stuff because you're, you're paying attention to what you're doing well while fixing things that you're not doing optimally as opposed to trying to discover how do I do that thing that I have no idea how to do yet, right? So it just kind of makes sense to practice this way, and so kudos, I think this is a good job. So that's two from the same person. Let's take a look at uh, someone else's singing, and this is this is another thing I love. Just want to give a quick props to people in my community for being incredibly encouraging. I love this. That sounded really nice. Sounds like you can hit those high notes a lot easier as well. Here's a super quick clip. Just to keep you guys updated, I've been busy, so I haven't been chat much, but I still wanted to post anyway, because I'm a bad mother trucker. Thank you, Logan, for posting. All right, let's take a listen to this. Who can say where the road goes only time? Okay, well, that's a little short. Uh, yeah, <laughs> someone else already said a little bit more than seven seconds would be helpful. But let's let's uh, let's still take get what we can out of that. So this is, I think, an example of it. And it's really hard with a um, video as well. I mean, obviously, the more I can see and hear, the better. Um, but just grabbing from what we got right there, um, I know that this person, this individual, likes songs that have a lot of leaps and go a lot of different places. Um, and that's been a challenge to have the intonation be right spot on when that happens. So here's what I mean. So this is uh, what, what I'm trying to say is that I am happy that Logan here took a tune that doesn't move very far, right? Traditionally, he would be doing something that goes like, like, you know, like that's kind of a little bit all over the place. But this one is just a bunch of straight notes. And straight notes are really, 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 really good for calling you out on tension. So this doesn't move that much. Let's take a look at how much it moves on the piano. All right, so this is really simple. Right, that's pretty much the seven seconds that we were given. So that is a half step and a whole step. Not a lot of movement here, right? And the fact that those notes kind of keep repeating end up exposing one of Logan's uh, tension issues, which is the tongue tension. Now, I've, I haven't been able to see, you know, and I, listen, I respect people's privacy. I respect uh, that people don't always want to be uh, camera, and I totally get that. 
Um, so the best guess that I have from that sound, if I were to try and recreate it, would be... Who, who can say that da, da And it's not that I don't hear the pitch. I'm going flat because there's tension. So the tongue is going back a little bit, and the soft palate is down. And that's going to be what creates that sound most likely. Now I want to put a huge asterisk on this, because I think it's really important to mention that these muscles don't live in isolation, which is why you know it's always nice to have videos. So if I have my tongue out, there's a lot of ways it can go back. I can, I can be exhaling with too much force and that can draw the tongue back. Um, I can, here, check this out. Watch me contract my back. Right, check this out. <sighs> That's gonna bring the tongue back, right? So if you have like a really difficult job or if you're playing a lot of sports or you're powerlifting and you're working your back in any sort of extreme way, these muscles are attached to one another, right? Um, and I won't bother to get out an anatomy diagram, uh, but just know that it's a cascading effect, right? That your glutes can make your lats tight, can make this tight. And so um, one of the things that I would recommend that Logan do is I would recommend he stretch because I can say, don't make your tongue go back, but it might not be the tongue that, like he might try to force the tongue forward and notice how that's that tongue, I'm contracting my back and I'm trying to put my tongue forward. Notice how it's not wide, right? You need a forward tongue, but it needs to be wide. You need to be basically able to chew it. Right now I can chew on my tongue. Very important. And that's why I want to generally recommend that Logan stretch and be cognizant of where his tongue is and not try to force the tongue position to be in the correct spot, but to more observe when it is not, and maybe ask the question why, do some stretches, see if that helps. You gotta have these sort of experimental attitudes when you're practicing, it's really helpful. Now, the other thing I mentioned that might be the problem was the lowered soft palate, okay? So the tongue and the palate are definitely, they, they have a lot of relationships, they, they have some things in common, so if the tongue is back, chances are, the palate is down, but they're still separate. So it pays to know what those differences are. So let's get into that. The soft palate you can feel by inhaling a K sound. Put the tongue in the roof of your mouth as if you're saying NG, right? And the part that's lifting in the back here, you can feel that tongue around there. That's your soft palate. And the difference in sound from when it's raised versus when it's lowered is actually really interesting. So I'm gonna show that right now. This is lowered soft palate. Lowered soft palate with a wide tongue, by the way. There we go. That's a little higher. So that's higher. I'm gonna lower it again. Right? So you can definitely see that there's something about lowering the soft palate that almost like bludgeons the sound or blunts it, maybe is a better word. And you know, that's a sort of a um, colorful way of describing it. Uh, but you heard the difference. And so it, a raised soft palate is not used in every genre of music, but for the most part, it's lifted in almost all genres of music. There are definitely exceptions. Um, what I encourage you to do is I encourage you to learn what those sounds are and learn how these things work. Try to be able to lower it, try to be able to lift it. And by doing that, you'll be able to make artistic decisions about the sounds that you want. And that's ultimately the most liberating, you know, being able to make 
decisions. So I've been following you on social media for quite a while now. Your choral singing is absolutely legendary, and I enjoy all of your work. Though I was always curious if you had ever done or tried to do anything poppy or chest voice type singing. If so, that would be sweet and swell to see a secret reveal video after you reach a certain goal with your lessons. Why, thank you, Jake. Um, chest or poppy? So... Chest voice, I assume what you're meaning there is belting. I don't do belting. Um, I have nothing against it. I just don't know how to do it. I don't know how to do it well. Uh, and it is something that can hurt you if you are ignorant in the way that I am ignorant about it, so I don't do it. As far as poppy goes, not all pop is uh, belting. Um, pop is, just like any genre, sort of a very, very expansive thing. So there is, um, there's belting and then there's other things. Uh, let's take a look at actually an example. So I think as an example of this, I'm going to go with, uh, uh Poets of the Fall, which is a poppy-ish group. Um, certainly this song, Roses, is very poppy. So, um... Grow me a garden of roses, paint me the colors of sky and rain. Teach me to speak with their voices, show me the way and I'll try again. Without you, I am nothing at all. Right, so depending on the style of pop, I can do that. But if, if you're going to do like something like a... Uh, Billie Jean is not my lover She's just a girl who claims that I am the one Um, you know, the classical idioms that I have trained and built up are these they, they slip in, they slip in You know, a lot of the vibrato here and there I don't think it sounds bad But I, I just don't think it's like totally idiomatic of pop Um if I were to go, like, if, if say, for example, you don't want to learn classical, you want to learn pop, you just want to learn pop, you can learn about the voice if you take lessons from a teacher who knows how the voice works. You know, a lot of classical stuff you can take and then work with and then change if you know what you're doing, um, but you have to know what you're doing, um, you know, and for that, that's why whenever I talk about, like, for example, with the soft palate lowering and raising you know, you might have thought objectively that lowering the soft palate sounds bad, but there might be instances where it's incredibly desirable artistically as a decision. And so to be able to make those decisions is where I think y you want to focus on that when trying to go for voice lessons instead of trying to say, I want a pop teacher or I want a classical teacher or I want this teacher. You don't want to learn a genre. You want to learn about the voice. There's a big difference there, and it's a really important distinction, and I encourage everyone to do that. Because um, it's made a big difference I in my classical singing, which is what I want to pursue. I want to pursue jazz. I want to pursue classical professionally. Just that's, Those are my own aspirations. But by knowing stuff about other genres, by knowing what's going on with my voice as I sing, I've been much better. I've been able to have fun with other genres while also pursuing classical music. Here's an example. Um, White Wedding, right? So if I go with like Billy Idol, is it Billy Idol? I don't even know. I think it's Billy Idol. Um, but if I go with like White Wedding, I was playing around with this at work uh, when I was stocking milk in the freezer anyway. Um, it's a nice day to start again. Now that's totally not appropriate for the tune, right? But there's a reason why I was doing that instead of the other way around, because if I want that fry, I have to be doing the top note like perfectly. I have to, because fry is really, 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 really dangerous. Uh, phonated frying is really not good for your health uh, if you if it's done badly. And it should probably not be done much at all, um, particularly not in one sitting. So if I do, start again, like if I, I gotta get it just right and then I'll show you how I grind it out. Start again, and then start again, right? Uh, I can fry, I can do all sorts of crazy stuff to get that grit that he does. It's a nice day for a white wedding, you know. And that doesn't sound entirely convincing because I don't do it that often. 
Uh, but I was playing around with it, and I know how to do it, I know how to train it, I know how to practice it. Um, but yeah, it's not my jam. So that, to answer your question about like poppy versus chest and all that stuff, um, if you know what you're doing, you are a lot better off um, going to a voice teacher looking to learn about the voice and not about genre, right? And that goes for anything. If someone is, I'm, class I'm a classically trained musician, I'm a, I'm a classical, blah, 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 blah. avoid that person. <laughs> like the plague. Avoid them like the plague. Because um, what they're doing is they're going to teach you a bunch of things that are idiom idiomatic to classical music. Which is not wrong in and of itself, but if you don't know why you're doing it, even if you're pursuing classical music, and you don't know why you're doing all these idiomatic things, you'll have a misunderstanding and you'll get lost along the way without them there writing you on uh, all the specifics. And that's even if they know and understand the specifics themselves, which maybe they don't, in which case you're just totally screwed. So that is the kind of answer to your question, Jake. That was long and winded, but uh, I'm a windbag. <laughs>